Good Faith and the Pride of Elias. We're in the studio to review two films this week for you. Uh, the Greatest Showman and Coco. Good morning. Morning, morning. Um, I'm not, uh, I was playing around with Facebook Live earlier and there's a little, there's a little thing that you can make yourself look like a character in Coco. So if I can actually do it in the middle, because we're going we're gonna to start with The Greatest Showman. If I can switch it in the middle, I'll switch it. It's quite funny. It is. I see it. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> but we'll talk about The Greatest but, Showman but it first. It is worth going on Facebook Live. Yeah, definitely. Howard for film. Howard for film. Okay. F-O-R. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about The Greatest Showman first because it actually opened last week. Um, but I was talking about Star Wars last week. Speaking of Star Wars, have you heard about all this backlash that's going on with Star Wars? No, I haven't. The, the fan kids are all upset with the, with the, with the movie because they say it's not true to the franchise. And, you know, when the, when the film first came out, the very first few days... Everybody was so excited Yeah, they were, so, they were like, oh, best movie ever! Then all of a sudden they turned on mass and they the worst movie ever! And now they're furious. But the, the film is still on track to make a billion dollars plus. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so they're all... And even Mark Hamill last week came out and said that it, he was very upset with what happened with his character. And then yesterday he issued an apology because somebody must have said, you've just killed your... What little career you have, you've just killed. <laughs> and so he's issued an apology now. And then Disney, for their part, has come out yesterday and said, you know, they're making this new Han Solo Star Wars movie, which I think Ron Howard is directing, coming out next year, I believe. And even now Disney said, oh, it's not going to be a good movie. So they, I think they're lowering expectations. Oh, it's all rather okay, crazy. So watch this space. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's get on with um, this story, which is not quite about Bonham and Bailey's circus, but about a focus on P.T. Bonham of said circus. Correct. Yeah, it's very, very, very loosely based on the life of P.T. Barnum. Yes, lots of artistic license <laughs> Completely. with this. Yeah, even, even in the movie they say, or in the start or in the trailer, it says inspired by, because, you know, even they know that it's... Yes, rather than based on a true story. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's based on a true character, and that's about as far as it goes. Yeah, so this is, this is the um, passion project of Hugh Jackman, who, if you didn't know, is not just Wolverine. The man sings and dances up a storm. If you've never seen him on stage, he's really an amazing, talented guy. So no, no lip syncing to oh. someone else doing the vocals. Here. Somebody else was lip syncing in the film, which I'll talk about, but he was singing. All right. Okay. Well, I suppose you know, he is lip syncing to himself because they do record it in a sound studio. But it is his voice. It is yeah. his voice, and those are his feet dancing. No, he's incredibly talented. So he had this idea to do this film. All, all the, it went all the way back to 2009, but apparently no studio wanted to touch the film because Barnum is a very complex character. You know, in, in the film, and this is one of the issues that I have with the film and many other people have with the film, is that uh, it really glosses over a lot of his character. He wasn't such a nice guy. Mm -hmm. and and the film makes it look like he's he's putting um physically disadvantaged people on stage in the circus because he's one of them you know he he was also he grew up very very poor true story and he also felt that he was disadvantaged shunned from society so you know he, so his motivation was to to bring people like him out to the fore and have mainstream society say to these people, okay, we accept you as you are. That's really what the theme of this film is. Well, that's just not true at all. The man was a snake oil salesman, plain and simple, and he saw an opportunity to make a buck. That's why he did it. So this is one of the problems that I have with the film is that it, it really glosses over what kind of person Barnum really was. And how do you know? That, I, that was the kind of person he really was. Because I read. <laughs> I did my research. <laughs> so, yeah. Based so the, on your opinion, Howard. Well, no, you? not just my opinion. I'm just, I, you know, before I go on the radio, I do my research. So, yeah, I do. So, um, but, uh, so anyhow, yeah, no studio wanted to touch the film, but eventually it did get made. Uh, it's directed by an Australian fellow, and Jackman also is Australian. Maybe they know each other, um, but the fellow's name is Michael Gracie. If you've never heard of him, there's, there's a good reason for that. This is his first Hollywood film. He's done commercials. He's done videos. He's a special effects wizard, apparently. And this is his first big budget film, and sadly it shows, because outside of the 
the song and dance numbers, which are, by the way, fantastic. I'm not going to take anything away from that. There's no story. It's a very, very weak story. And there's any any arc, that dramatic arc that happens with the characters is, is, is very short-lived. It's over by the time the next production number starts. So uh, when I saw the film, I saw it with some friends who had already bought the soundtrack, and they had listened to the soundtrack multiple times, and they were in love with the soundtrack. And afterwards, one of my friends said, what did you think of the film? I said, great, great music, great dance numbers, but no story. And, and this friend said, yeah, I know, but who cares? <laughs> so and 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 I've heard that comment many times. People say, "Okay, so the story is garbage, but the song and dance numbers are fantastic." You're just sitting there waiting for the next musical You're number. That's really what this film is all about. You're waiting for the next number to take place. How long do you have to wait? The running time is 105 minutes. So <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of song and, and dance numbers. Songs. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like... divide it. You know, it's every few minutes. <laughs> And and you know what, this very interestingly, the, the music is was penned by two guys, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who were the guys who wrote the music to La La Land. And one of the problems I had with La La Land was that it starred two actors who couldn't sing and dance. And people said, "Oh, Emma Stone, such a beautiful voice." No, she doesn't. <laughs> Stop saying she's got a good voice. She doesn't. Did she really sing it? Yeah, she did. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But those songs. Because I haven't seen it. I, I, oh, I, I, yeah, I'm well. meaning to because it's uh, obviously. You might like it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know the, the song. Yeah. yeah, the songs in La La Land were very tonally simple. See, now you would appreciate this because you're in Radio Four. You know music, supposedly, and you. If you compare the other works that they've done, there's a play on Broadway called Dear Evan Hansen, which swept the Tony Awards this past year. They also wrote the music of Dear Evan Hansen. If you listen to the music for that play, and you can listen to it on YouTube, it's more complex because it's written for people who can sing, whereas La La Land was written for people who can't sing. You know? And so fortunately, in this film, it's also written for people who can sing. So the songs are good. They're, they're challenging. They're good songs. You have, as I said, you have Hugh Jackman who can sing. You have Zac Efron can sing. Zendaya can sing. Michelle Williams can sing. Um, now, very interestingly, the one person in the film who can't sing is dubbed. It's uh, Rebecca Ferguson who plays Swedish opera singer Jenny Lind. She sings a song called Never... What's it called? Never... Never, sur not never surrender. I can't remember what it's called. And they cast her as the famous singer. And they cast her as the famous singer. I, I have to say, acting wise, she is very good. But and she's Lauren oh, Allred. Lauren Allred. Well, so anyhow, she sings a song Bites called. Her voice. Yeah, she sings a song called "Never Enough," which actually was my favorite song in the film. It is absolutely beautiful, but it's not her singing. It's Lauren Allred. If you don't know who Lauren Allred is, she won. Oh, she didn't win. She was she competed on season three of TV's The Voice, which I've never watched, no. and. But I, I would predict she's going to become the next Jennifer Hudson because, you know, Jennifer Hudson was in American Idol and she was like number seven and she went and won, you know, she ended up winning an Oscar for, for uh, Dreamgirls. And I think th this woman, Lauren Allred, has got a gorgeous voice and, and I have a feeling uh, she, she might win something for this song as well. So, yeah, very interestingly that they cast her. Uh, they didn't cast her, they cast somebody else to, to lip sync. So, all in all, I'd say... If you ignore the story, you're going to love the song and dance numbers. You're going to love the costuming. You're going to love the staging. But the story is horrible. <laughs> so you're not even going to go into the plot? No, it's... Just it's, a little bit, just briefly? No, the plot, the, plot is rags to, the plot is rags to riches. You know, he's a poor boy. He has this image. He grows up. He's, he's, he gets married, has two kids. I don't know if he really had two kids or how many kids he had. He has two little girls in this film. And he has this, he has this dream of making a, a circus. Well, it starts out being a museum and morphs into being a circus. And people are against him. And, you know, society doesn't like it. And, you know, a couple of song and dance numbers later, and everybody's happy. So that, that's really what the story's about. So, yeah, I, you know, again, just go for the song and dancing. Okay. Or buy the soundtrack. <laughs> or buy the soundtrack, yeah. Or buy the soundtrack. Yeah. Okay. And then we have uh, Coco. Yeah, so let, let me just, now I'm going to change my, okay, oh, now you have to watch me on Facebook Live because this is really good. Okay. <laughs> 
He's one of the characters in Coco now. <laughs> now I'm one of the characters in Coco. Okay. Oh, it's, I'm just amazed. I'm watching myself here. I'm amazed. All right. Now, did you know one of the most popular holiday gifts for adults this season was, um, or one of the most popular gifts this holiday season, oh, I, change, I keep changing back and forth. I guess every time I move, I change back and forth. So, um, oh, this, I have to... No, you have to stay in one place I, or yeah. turn it off. No, I'm going to turn it off because the noise is driving me crazy. But it was fun while it lasted. Okay. Okay, so one of the most popular gifts for adults this season was a home DNA analysis kit. Everybody is is spitting into, into a plastic bag and sending it off to a company to get their DNA analyzed. Even they're doing it for their pets as well, apparently. Well, you're looking gross. You never heard about this? No, no, I haven't heard of it. Oh, it's huge, huge business. Apparently, a lot of these companies, they won't ship to Hong Kong. But but I know people of Hong Kong who, in Hong Kong who've done it because what they do is they have it shipped to an American address and then the people in the American address ship yeah, it they, here. Oh, yeah. And then you have to ship your spit back to America and the, <laughs> Have them soon enough. I've never okay. done it. And um, wh why do people want to do this? Genealogy is a booming industry. Everybody yeah, wants. But what are they testing for? I mean, there's thousands of things. Well, they want to see if they're related to royalty. They want an invitation to Prince Harry's wedding. <laughs> Clearly, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Not, not Big Brother by any chance. Well, that's why I've never done it. Honestly, okay. that's why, yeah, that's that's Wait, what scares what, what me. What has this got to do with Coco? Because the issue, why are we talking about dead people? The issue. It's DNA. <laughs> we're talking about DNA. <laughs> but we're talking about you. We want to know if we're related to dead people. And, and why am I mentioning this? Because that's the focus of the film Coco. Now, the Mexicans have a holiday called Dia de Muertos. I the check, Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead. I even, you know, I've seen Dia de, de los Muertos. But, ah, see, now it's funny you say that because I checked with a Mexican friend last yeah. night. I said, which is it? And he said, it's Dia de Muertos. There's no los. 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 No? No. Okay. He said, common mistake. So Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead, where friends and family get together and pray for and remember their ancestors who, are, who have died and support them in their spiritual journey. And not just the Mexicans have this holiday, Chinese have a similar holiday called Ghost Month. Now, Day of the Dead is a very colorful affair with family altars decked out with marigolds and they prepare drinks and, and uh, food. It's an animated film. Yeah, it's a, it's a film yeah. about dead people. <laughs> It's amazing. So the story, the story. I don't think you mentioned that it was an animation. Well, I'm getting there. I'm okay. getting there. So the story is it's 12 year old Miguel Rivera, voiced by newcomer Anthony Gonzalez, who's 12 years old. For this year, Day of the Dead is a bit problematic because decades earlier, his great grandfather left his great grandmother and their young daughter Coco, that's the name Coco to pursue a career in music. And since that time, music has been banned in the Rivera household. They became, they went from a family of musicians to a family of shoemakers. And great-grandmother refuses to have music played in the house. Or grand, uh, grandmother, great-grandmother. There's a few generations in that family. But Miguel doesn't see his future in footwear. He secretly dreams of becoming a musician, just like his idol, Ernesto de la Cruz, voiced by Benjamin Bratt. Now, one, so he, uh, for, for Day of the Dead, there's a big concert, not a concert, sort of like a talent show in their village in Mexico. And Miguel decides to steal Ernesto's guitar so that he can perform in this talent show. But the guitar, it turns out, is cursed. And when he steals it, he enters the land of the dead along with his little wiener dog, Dante. <laughs> You know, they have these Mexican hairless dogs. There's a name for these dogs. Chihuahuas. Not chihuahua. No, no, no. They're bigger. Like They're, they're like big chihuahuas. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it's called. Know. But yeah, basically that's what it is. It's a big chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> so he and Dante end up in the land of, of the dead. And he, he learns that he, once he's there, that in order to get back to the land of the living, he has till sunrise to get back to the land of the living. So he enlists the help of a trickster, Hector Rivera. And Hector is voiced by Gael Garcia Bernal, wonderful. I think he's Mexican. 
Or is he Chilean? Basically, in this movie, you have a who's who of Latin American. It's all Latin it's all Latin American. Latin American yeah, so it's all it's. They say it's an actors. all Latino cast. Yeah, yeah, voice cast. So he he enlists the help of Hector to find Ernesto de la Cruz because little Miguel believes that Coco's father was Ernesto, and he feels that if he can get Ernesto to break the curse, he can go back to the land of the living and play music. You know, to get his family to agree to play music. Now, when I heard that they were going to make this film, I said, how can you make a film, an animated film for children about dead people? <laughs> Just like, what audacity. But I got to tell you, it works. It works big time. It is such a wonderful, charming film that I just, I sat there with a smile on my face the whole time. Really? Not even a tear from time to time? Well, Apparently there are some I'll yes, emotionally I'll tell you. overwhelming moments in this. There are times that I was holding back the tears, and certainly I heard a few sniffles and a few noses being blown, for sure. Mm -hmm. So when you go see this film, definitely take along, take along some Kleenex with you. So this film is made by Pixar. It's the same company that made Inside Out and Finding Nemo and Up. So you know the animation is going to be fabulous and it and it really is there's there's so much detail in the in the in the sets like you can you, you know it's the kind of movie that you want to watch in slow motion so that you can see all the detail because apparently there's lots of wide screen so lots you know a lot of things in a shot there's a lot of things yeah, in a shot right. yeah you, so you need to go yeah you, you or i could only catch so you much. can't see everything mm -hmm. but yeah so I, it's kind of feeling yeah that's why you want to see it in slow motion or stop you know stop it every once in a while so you can look at each thing there's there's so much subtlety in the music there's one scene where little miguel is learning to play the guitar and he's got his He's got his tongue out, you know, on the side of his mouth, the way a little kid would do that, trying to, you know, get the chord right. Mm, you know, I yeah. thought, you know, there was so much thought put into it. The colors are vivid. You know, it's absolutely beautiful. The Land of the Dead, very interestingly and quite funnily, I would have to say, the Land of the Dead looks a bit like Disneyland on, <laughs> on LSD. <laughs> Now, Disney owns Pixar, so it's quite, you know, it's quite, uh, I'm sure it was done on purpose to make it look like Disneyland. But this theme park has skull-shaped fireworks and other bony motifs. I mean, it's very witty, really, really. So it's not, it's, I would say it's not just a film for children, it's a film for adults as well. The songs are also wonderful. They were written by Oscar winners Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, who wrote the music to Frozen, and Michael Giacchino, who wrote the music to Up. All three of them won Oscars. So the music is really, really good. My only disappointment is none of them is in Spanish. They're all in English. Wow. I'm in Spanish. So I was disappointed about that. But interestingly, what we learn from this film is that there's life and death in the afterlife. And here's where I'm why I mentioned DNA. Because at one point, Hector tells Miguel, when there's no one left in the world who remembers you, you disappear. And I think this is why there's this, this push, or why there's everybody is so interested, or so many people are interested in genealogy, because they want to remember who came before them. And by doing that, we're bringing these people to life. Oh. oh. Yeah. I mean, I look. I do genealogy as well. That's a great idea. Yeah. So. For that reason. Yeah, for that reason. So I give this film two very bony thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love it. I think this is a film I would see again because there's so much. As I said, there's so much to see in the film. The music is wonderful. The story is great. You're gonna cry. You're gonna laugh. You'll probably sing along once you know the music. Um, it's and it's a film for kids. You know, again, I thought, ooh, you really want kids to see skeletons and, and talking about dead people? And I say, yep, yeah, you can do it. You can bring a four-year-old, and the kid will be fine. And you mentioned that earlier the the, the dog. Uh, yeah, it's 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 modeled on the national dog of Mexico. And you try and to pronounce that word. I can't. I can't. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> Begins at with an X, like, right? Yes, yes. It's very long, and I uh, no way. <laughs> yeah. So let's call it let's call it a giant Chihuahua, a weenie do, wiener dog, whatever. Yeah. I should have asked my Mexican friend how to pronounce it. Now, so. would you call this film a classic? I think it will be a classic. I really think this is this really is is look. Pixar makes great films, no question about it. This is really one of the best of the best that they've done. Highly, highly recommended. Okay.
Okay, Hallie, thank you very much. Thanks, see ya.